The women's soccer team has faced many challenges transitioning since COVID-19 gripped the nation. Players could not practice for a while and their preseason games were canceled. Now the season is here and they are able to play again due to taking extra steps to stay safe enough to play and for the fans to watch. The virus hasn't stopped the women's soccer team. I think honestly it's helped us. Uh, you know, obviously no one wants to be cooped up like we were um, for April and March and all that kind of good stuff. But at Zoom, which uh, has helped us, we, I guess at the end of May, started having team Zoom meetings, talking about our season and trying to get to know each other and put together connections. We do three C's where we ask our players to work on the three C's and it's courage, connection, and commitment. And in that time, we were actually talking about different things that would help us to show our courage for each other at this time in COVID. And then of course, connecting with each other by trying to you know, know that we all have our journeys and, and how can we help each other and uplift each other to, to achieve what we want to do in our journey. And then of course, commitment to each other in the sense of trying to get our daily workout in um, and our ball skills, even at the time when it, we can't be together. So I've really been proud of them. They, they've stayed committed, they've worked together. And I think it's also paid off for us. You know, when we did come in, I know the players, I've heard them speak about how they felt like, you know, they, they already were connected with the freshmen. And that's one thing that we try to do during preseason is to try to get a connection. But like you said, we can't all be in, you know, one area at a time or, you know, you got to be masked up. You can't really see the, you know, expressions on everybody's faces. Teammates have built new relationships on and off the field. We tried our best to overcome it and to make the best out of it. It's happening and we can't really avoid it. So we just want to face it head on and get ready and be successful this season. Stepping in the right direction, the university has made it possible for these ladies to continue playing the sport they love. For Bobcat Update, I'm Christina Willis. Hello, welcome to our latest edition of Bobcat Update. I'm Christina Willis. Today we have stories across Central Texas to bring you, but our focus, of course, is what's happening at Texas State University. Prospective students are again allowed to tour the campus. The Welcome Center at the LBJ Student Center reopened last week and is offering tours after a long break. Shelby Copeland has the story. These ladies have put in the time and hard work to make the most of it. Working as a team has really helped them through it all. They are excited to play and determined to outdo any opponent they face. Well, definitely doing the little things. I think we got a little caught up in the, like, the bigger picture rather than breaking it down and doing the basic stuff. With their determination and coaching staff's guidance, the team has overcome every challenge they have faced. Oh, it's been crazy. Uh, it's just been crazy when you, you don't know how many kids are going to be in practice. You don't know, you know, we're still on pins and needles getting ready to find out if anyone tested positive this week and who could be out. And so we're, we're, um, we're taking it actually and trying to just say that's not going to be an excuse. The pandemic has affected all sports at Texas State in various ways, but the women's volleyball team is ready to put the difficulties aside and play their hearts out. For Bobcat Update, I'm Christina Willis. Good afternoon, this is Bobcat Update. I'm Christina Willis. The votes are still being counted in some battleground states. Former Vice President Joe Biden leads in the popular vote and appears to have enough votes to secure an electoral college victory as well. However, President Trump says he will demand selected recounts and will contest the outcome in the courts. The 2020 election had more voter turnout than any election in American history. Republican incumbent U.S. Senator John Cornyn won re-election on Tuesday. His challenger was former Air Force pilot M.J. Hagar. Cornyn received 53.7% of the vote. Texas has not elected a Democrat to the U.S. Senate since 1988. He was first elected to the chamber in 2002 and serves as Majority Whip. The 21st congressional seat was up for grabs this week in a race between Democrat Wendy Davis and Republican Chip Roy. The incumbent Roy won the contest to represent the district, which stretches from Ray All County west of San Antonio to Blanco County west of Austin. He defeated Davis, a former state senator, 53 to 46%. San Marcos Mayor Jane Houston is leading in her re-election bid. 
However, Houston only received about 45% of the vote, not the 50% required to avoid a runoff. So she will have to face her top vote getting challenger Juan Miguel Arrando on December 1st. More than 15,000 ballots were cast in the mayoral race this week. Houston was elected mayor in 2018 and is a long-term San Marcos resident. Her challenger Rondo served five years as a school board trustee. A runoff is also necessary for two candidates vying for the place five position on the city council because no candidate received a majority of the votes in this week's election. Omar Baca and Mark Gleason were the top vote getters for the spot. Again, the runoff election in San Marcos is set for December 1st. It was a close vote for Hayes County Sheriff. Incumbent Gary Cutler received 51% of the vote, according to the Hayes County Election Office. His opponent, Alex Vielbos, received 49%. Close to 105,000 votes were cast in the election. Cutler, who ran as a Republican, has served as a Hayes County Sheriff since 2010. Democrat David Peterson was re-elected as Precinct 1 Constable in Hayes County defeating Eliso Garza with about 70% of the votes. In other Constable races, Democrat Michael Torres won about 55% of the votes against his opponent Steve Avalos. Republican Don Montague won about 64% of the votes against Cynthia Malanzi. The county constables representing precincts 4 and 5 will stay the same since Ron Hood and John Ellen were both uncontested in their respective races. Two propositions calling for $7 billion to be sent on the transportation needs in Austin have been approved by voters. City officials say one of the propositions will introduce a comprehensive transit plan that includes a new rail service as well as an expansion of the bus system with hopes of making the fleet all electric. The long-term plan will provide for an underground rail service connecting Austin Bergstrom Airport to downtown Austin. Property owners in Austin will likely see their taxes rise about 4% as a result of the propositions being approved. The incumbent representing Texas House District 45 has been re-elected for another term. Democrat Aaron Zwiener won against Kerry Isaac by 52 to 47% margin. Zwiener will continue to represent Hayes and Blanco counties in the House. She says she hopes to reform the Texas revenue system, delegate power to the counties to plan the future development, reform gun control, and improve transportation in Central Texas.